protein. Um, quickly with protein, I just like with calories, sometimes I think it's really interesting to do your protein calculation, and I included it in that packet. Um, but oftentimes, I'll get people that come to me and they'll say to me like, I am starving all day long. I try to control myself. I am so hungry. I don't know what to do. Um, and then when I go through what they're eating, they're often lacking in protein. So um, I think it's a good idea to, to do your protein calculation occasionally. Basically what it is, is your weight in pounds divided by 2.2. That gives you kilograms. And then your kilograms times your activity level factor. Most people, it's 0.8. That'll give you normal amount. Most active adults, if you're exercising, it might be anywhere from 0.8 to 1. Um, you can also find online calculators for this as well. But for example, if your weight is 160, you would divide it by 2.2. That gives you 72.72 kilograms, which just kind of worked out well. This would be how, how much protein we should be eating. Per day, yes. Per day. Yep. The grams of protein. So this person needs 58 grams of protein per day. And every once in a while, I'll have someone say like, that's insane. That's an insane number. And then we figure out how to do it. And they're like, oh, it's not insane. And now I feel full. And I was missing out on protein. So there's a lot of different sources of protein. We often just think of meat. There are plant sources of protein as well. Um, this actually, this picture was made by a dietitian in Australia, which is why it has kangaroo on it. And I always think it's really funny, so I always include it. Quark yogurt, I don't know what that is, but. <laughs> um, the cool thing about your body is that it kind, of, it kind of knows what you need. So a serving of protein is about the size of your palm. Now, if you're looking at your hand and you're like, why? giant hands or I have really tiny hands, that's fine because that's your body size. So if you have a big hand, you need a little bit more protein for your body size. If you have a small hand, you need a little bit less. But most people's palm is about three ounces. So you know if you're like trying to size up how much chicken you should have or fish, it's about the size of your palm. You're doing okay. Eating environment. This stuff fascinates me, the eating environment. Um, Story short, Pavlov had, Pavlov had a dog. Um, when he would ring a bell, nothing would happen. Then he conditioned the dog to eat food and hear a bell ringing. So then eventually, when the dog heard the bell, he would start to salivate, thinking there was food coming. It was just this unconscious thing that happened. Um, what does this have to do with nutrition? Well, um, I sometimes ask people, do you have a bell? Is there something that sets off this unconscious desire to eat? When I ask that, most people say no, and then I'll remind them, like, what about the catch in the TV? Do you ever find yourself feeling hungry watching TV? You're a big boredom eater, you're a nighttime eater, that's huge, especially in my weight loss classes, that's huge, nighttime eating, car eating. I had a woman once who just cut down on her car eating, just don't, let's not eat in the car. Let's only eat inside. She, one of the biggest factors in what we eat is access, convenience, and ease. And I'm sure we all know this, but the ease of eating makes it so that we eat more. This is a cool study. So what they did here is um, they took, they had people in an office and on the secretary's desk, they put Hershey Kisses in either a clear jar or in an opaque jar that they couldn't see through. Right. And the people who passed the clear jar ate 47% 40, more Hershey Kisses than the opaque jar. So seeing food mm -hmm. is one of our biggest indicators. To, don't have to be like cutting back on food. I don't like to work from like this restrictive mentality where it's like, you can't eat this, you can't eat this. So sometimes I'll take the approach with people and I'll say like, well, if you're trying to eat less potato chips, why don't you put the potato chips in this dark bin and put it on a high shelf so it's harder for you to get to, you can't see it. 
it's still there. Like you can have it if you want it, but it's just a strategy. Like we know human nature, if it sees food, it's gonna want it. So that's just something we can do. And then we can also put the foods that we're trying to eat more of, the fruits and vegetables, in a spot that's easy for us to get to. So we open the fridge, it's right there. You know, we have the cut up fruits and veggies right there when you open it up and you take the lo mein and you put it in the back. Like just that little bit of inconvenience to have to reach over stuff yeah. and get it. Like research backed will make people not eat food as much. <laughs> Hunger scale, this, this is complex. I sometimes introduce, I, the last time I did this with a group of people, um, there was a woman who just started crying because um, she didn't know, be, because of diets and diet culture, she had stuffed down her hunger so much, she could no longer recognize hunger. So ideally we want to live in the zone where we're kind of hungry and then we get kind of full. We get out of that zone and we're uncomfortably hungry or uncomfortably full, we make bad, not bad decisions, but we make the decisions that we wouldn't otherwise make. So I often ask people if, are you hungry enough to eat an apple? That's a good judge of your hunger. An apple is kind of a neutral food. Nobody's ever craving it. No one ever hates it. But if you're hungry enough to eat an apple, you might actually be hungry and need to eat. But if you're sitting in front of the TV and you're like, ah, I'm gonna really eat right now. Should I have some potato chips? If you ask yourself, am I hungry enough to eat an apple? And the answer is no. Then you can really cycle through what's really going on. Am I tired? Am I bored? Am I thirsty? Am I emotional? So it's just a pretty cool test. And I did include the hunger scale in this packet. Um, that's actually, it's a function of leptin. Leptin is a satiety hormone. So when we eat, our fat cells, our fat cells actually do stuff, but our fat cells send leptin to the brain to tell the brain like, hey, we're full, we, we ate, we're satisfied, uh, but it takes leptin a while to get up to the brain. So that's how it takes 20 minutes. Yeah, so when we don't sleep well, our, our hunger is increased. So it's harder for people to eat well because they're craving those higher calorie things. Caffeine is incredibly stimulating. Some people need to stop it around if you're really caffeine sensitive, you might have to stop caffeine in you. Um, chocolate, though, has caffeine in it, and most, you know, a lot of desserts have chocolate. So sometimes when I have a caffeine sensitive person and they're having chocolate as a dessert, it just doesn't bode well for them. Alcohol. This is this is fascinating. <laughs> so alcohol can help you get to sleep. Definitely, if alcohol makes you sleepy makes perfect sense, it actually disrupts your REM sleep. So your REM sleep is the part of sleep. It's important, it's what helps you solidify your memories, it's where you do all of your repair. So if you've ever been, um, we, we enter REM sleep a certain amount of times throughout the night. So if you wake up at like three in the morning and you're just like, I don't know why I wake up at three in the morning every night, you're between REM sleeps. If you ever get woken up and you're like, oh, you're so frazzled and startled, you were probably in the middle of a REM sleep. But alcohol disrupts REM sleep, you don't enter it, so it, it causes you to have worse sleep. Um, balanced meals are important. Eating too few calories or too many calories throughout the day can disrupt your sleeping. Um, magnesium can be helpful for sleep. So we get magnesium through dark greens, beans, nuts, and seeds. I'm not huge on taking supplements. I feel like people should get their nutrition from food. But magnesium is actually a pretty good supplement for sleep. I'm not a fan of taking melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that naturally helps you sleep. Um, but you can actually, I, I don't think it's a great idea to be taking hormones willy nilly. Um, magnesium is a better option. If you're interested in getting better sleep and taking magnesium for sleep, you want to look for magnesium glycinate. Magnesium citrate is a laxative. I actually, I give this sleep to 
talk all the time. I recently had a patient at the food pharmacy who was going to get uh, a colonoscopy <laughs> for severe stomach issues. She recently started taking magnesium, and I was like, wait a minute, check the bottle. Are you taking magnesium glycinate or citrate? She called me, she was taking magnesium citrate. So she was having, she was taking a laxative basically. So she actually did not have to get the colonoscopy. That just, it felt so good. I was like, ah, nutrition saves the day. So the blue lights do suppress melatonin. Melatonin is the sleep hormone. The two biggest things that signal to the body it's time to wake up are light and food. So I sometimes have people who eat in the middle of the night because they're like, oh, it'll help me go to sleep. It's calming. It actually does the opposite. Um, so if you're eating too close to bedtime, that can keep you up. Um, but yeah, the blue light, you can get special glasses. That's what I recommend to people instead of the red lights. You can get like the blue light glasses. Um, you know, you can also switch your phone to that orange mode, stuff like that. Sleep hygiene, it doesn't mean like hygiene hygiene, but um, just like having a sleep routine can help you go to sleep. Sleep environment, making sure your sleeping environment is very comfortable. Light, I mean the blackout curtains can be really big. Um, exercise helps you sleep, so if you're exercising during the day, but if you're doing it right before bed, that can disrupt it. And I know this is not nutrition, but sleep ties so closely into nutrition that I always like to talk about sleep. What do we do now? So first and foremost, I always like to tell people you don't have to be perfect. We talk about sometimes the rule of 80-20. So as long as 80% of the time you're making a good effort to eat nutritious food, the other 20%, you can have pizza, you can have pancakes, like you can have things that you enjoy. It, you're not gonna be perfect 100% of the time. Um, and this at least frees you up, like if you wanna go out with your friends or if you wanna have something that you really like. Um, so 80-20 is what I, that's realistic. The other thing too, so with any sort of change, whether it be a nutrition goal or anything you want to change in your life, I never rely on motivation. That's the big thing I tell people. Motivation ebbs and flows. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. It's good to capitalize on motivation. You know, if you're motivated, you can think about a bunch of stuff that you want to change. But the more important thing is to pick small changes and make them happen. Small, small changes, I mean, slowing down at meal times, um, eating your vegetables first, adding 10 more minutes of activity throughout the day. Remember, it just has to be sustainable, the things that you're doing. So if you set this goal to like, uh, I had a woman once that wanted to go to Orange Theory five days a week. And that just felt so unsustainable. And it lasted for a week, but you know, if we replace it with like 30 minutes walking, that's a little bit more sustainable because you can do it throughout the day. 